Aren't you grateful to be in this house today? I was thinking as Sharon was singing that song, Oh, what a Savior. Oh, hallelujah, what a Savior. He gave his life's blood for you and me. I thought about this scripture and the sermon for today in John chapter 10, verse 10, where Jesus said, The thief comes only to kill, to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. This morning we began a new series of sermons for the next uh, 10 weeks or so on Solomon's secrets, Solomon's secrets to successful living. And today and I want us to look at living life well. When you think of living life well this morning, uh, what are the images that come to your mind? I want you to think about this morning, to live life well. To live life well, what does that really look like? What does that really say to you? What does it really mean to you if someone walked up to you and said, do you live life well? Are you living life well? What kind of images would come to your mind when you think about that? Would you think about uh, some of the material things of this life, such as maybe weeks, weekends in uh, New York City or month-long vacations in London, Rome, Paris, Nice, Monte Carlo? Would you think about having a 25,000-square-foot home with a small little mortgage? Would you think about a big shop building filled with nice, collectible, luxurious automobiles? Would you think about a portfolio of stocks and bonds that generate so much income that you could afford to tell the boss what you really think of him? Maybe, maybe you would just like to have an interview on television with some talk host about the latest book that you have written. You see, you may define living life well as not in those material things, but you may define it as uh, relationships, such as experiencing an emotionally and fulfilling marriage. Maybe you would ex say that you live life well if you had two or three really true blue, genuine friends that love you in spite of all there is that they know about you. Maybe you feel that living life well deals with rearing children that are intellectually and emotionally and spiritually prepared to be able to successfully navigate through life. You see, regardless of how you and I choose to define living life well, there's some good news and there's some bad news. Let me give you the bad news first you probably will never acquire all of those material possessions that you would love to achieve in life and all of those vocational goals and all of those experiences and all of those great relationships that you ever dreamed of. But there is some good news, and the good news is this. You and I can experience more than what perhaps we are experiencing presently in our life. Does God really want me to live life well, does God really want me to succeed in life? You see, I think that's a question a lot of people are probably uh, asking themselves this morning. Does God really want me to live life more fully than what I'm living life? When, when Jesus said, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly, what does that look like? To you and to me this morning. I want you to listen to some of these verses found in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29. Notice uh, Moses says, so keep the words of this covenant to do them. God is speaking here to him, through him, that you may prosper in all that you do. And then in Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, Moses has died and Joshua is now the military leader. He is uh, the leader of the nation of Israel. And Moses, uh, Joshua looks at the people of Israel and he says, this book 
of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then, for then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. The psalmist said in chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And he will be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And whatever he does, he prospers. Now, I realize those are all Old Testament scriptures. I realize those are God's promises to the nation of Israel if they promised uh, to abide by his commandments, God would reward their obedience. He would reward them with prosperity as a demonstration of his unique power over all those other heathen nations out there. But are God's promises of success and living well only limited to Old Testament characters? Listen to what the Apostle John said about his friend Gaius in 3 John 2. He said, Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. That word prosper is a synonym for the word succeed. And John wanted his friend to succeed in his spiritual life. But in doing that, he also wanted him to experience and live life well. I believe that God wants his children to live life well. So that you don't misunderstand what I'm saying this morning. Let me say this, it is not God's will for every Christian to be a gazillionaire. To live life well is not limited to financial success. I'm sure that God does want us to enjoy financial stability. I believe that God wants us to enjoy a those fulfilling relationships out there in life. I believe God wants us to experience and achieve more worthwhile goals than what we presently are experiencing. But whenever you speak of living life well, it means to experience God's best for every day area of life, from your spiritual life to your marital relationship to your career uh, to your financial situations, and to your family. You see, is it everything God wants it to be this morning? Is living life in these areas, is that everything? Are you doing what God wants you to do when you consider that very little looks different with Christians and non-Christians? You see, both Christians and non-Christians suffer with loneliness. Both Christians and non-Christians suffer with anger issues. Both Christians and non-Christians experience bankruptcy. Christians and non-Christians commit adultery. And according to statistics, Christians are not only as likely to divorce as non-Christians, but even more likely to divorce. So what is the reason for this disconnect between what we believe and how we behave? What is the disconnect? Why aren't we living life well? The Bible has an answer for that. In Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, the KJV version of the Bible, King James says, where there is no vision, the people perish. And the word vision there has nothing to do with setting goals or building church buildings, but the word vision means revelation from God. So in other words, without instruction from God, people are doomed to a miserable life. When I look at our nation, when I look at the disconnect this morning, 
I believe one of the major disconnects of this nation is because it was founded upon Judean Christian principles. And because we have gotten away from the Judeo-Christian principles, let me tell you, I think it is doomed for all of the chaos that we are experiencing. You see, Solomon said, if you really want to know how to live life, if you really want to know how to get fulfillment out of life, there's some secrets that are tucked away in the Word of God that will help you navigate and make life better and make a nation better, make your family better, and make your marriage relationships better. I believe that one of the reasons people's lives are in disarray this morning is because we have not acquired the necessary skills of living life well. And the Bible would call those skills wisdom. Wisdom, that's defined as the skill to live life according to God's plan. You see, the wise person is the one who patterns his finances, his goals, his relationships, and all other aspects of his life according to God's revealed design in his word. When you think this morning, the world says, for example, look out for number one. But wisdom would say, look out for others. The world would say, destroy your enemy. Wisdom would say, love your enemy. The world would say, promote yourself, elevate yourself, lift yourself up. Do whatever you have to do to get wherever you have to be. Wisdom would say, humble yourselves. You see, there are two truths we need to understand this morning about this skill of living life well called wisdom. First of all, wisdom is the opposite of our natural inclination. Have you ever bought something where you thought the screw turned this way and you just couldn't get it to work? And it just so happened to be it was a reverse screw. You see, wisdom is often the opposite of our natural inclination. Secondly, to gain wisdom requires effort. It requires study. Solomon compared this quest for wisdom with a treasure hunt for riches in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. He said, how blessed is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. For its profit is better than the profit of silver and its gain than fine gold. She is more precious than jewels and nothing you desire compares with her. You see, godly wisdom, young people, godly wisdom is far more valuable than anything that you can ever acquire in life. Young people, if I were your age all over again, and oh, how I wish I had the reverse screw, I would turn the hands of time in a New York minute. I would trade places with any one of you today. Now, some of you are out there going, our preacher's lost it. He's crazy. I would never go back and go through. I would. I would go back through it all over again to be your age again. But young people, I want to give you some words of wisdom this morning. If you will take the Word of God, if you will take the book of Proverbs, if you will take the book of Ecclesiastes, if you will take the book of John, let me tell you, you can learn a lot of things. The book of John it's all, all about the life and the teachings of Jesus. The book of Proverbs and the book of Ecclesiastes are what the wisest man in all the world, Solomon, learned after he went out in life and tried to find all the gusto that he could. But let me tell you, if you would take the advice from God's Word, let me tell you, You'll be a long way down the road when it comes to financial issues. You'll be a long way down the road when it comes to marital issues. You'll be a long way down the road when you have children and parenting issues. 
So as we look at Solomon's secrets for living, there are some underlying truths that we need to keep in mind. First of all, the focus of Proverbs in this life is for this life. The focus for Proverbs is in this life, not in the one to come. Secondly, the measure of living well is not money, even though there is a lot in the book of Proverbs about earning and saving and spending and investing. But the measure of living life well is not just about money. Thirdly, living well does not exempt us from problems. Let me tell you, living life well does not exempt you from problems. And there's a fourth thing that you and I need to understand this morning. The purpose of living life well is to glorify God. The purpose of living life well is to glorify God. Think about that this morning. Does your life have purpose? Does your life have meaning? Are you glorifying God this morning? You see, in all that we do, living well is not to satisfy ourselves as it is to glorify God. And when you think of the nation of Israel, whom God promised a more satisfying life, as a result of their obedience, God's ultimate purpose in rewarding them was this. Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 5 through 7. See, I have taught you statutes and judgments just as the Lord my God commanded me that you should do thus in the land where you are entering in to possess it. So keep and do them, for that is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as is the Lord our God whenever we call on him. You see, young people, what God was saying there to the Israelites, to the Jewish people was this, if you follow my wisdom for living, I will prosper you. But the reason for the blessings is so that others around you, other nations, will see the result of that obedience and say, what a great God they serve. I wonder what the second and third world nations of this world would do if all of those that are in positions to make laws and carry out laws and lead this nation, if they would ever come back to a place of Christian principles to see what God would do and how God would bless so that other nations of the world would look around and say, what an awesome God they serve. You see, that in the same way, God wants our lives to be a demonstration of the benefits of living well. And when we follow his wisdom for setting worthwhile goals, whether it's handling money, rearing children, building a strong marriage. You see, it's a win-win situation. God receives the glory. We receive the benefits. I would ask you this morning, are you living life well? Are you living the abundant life that Jesus wants you and me to live. This morning, as I think about that, I want to close with an illustration here. You see, God receives the glory when we are obedient and we're living life well, and we receive the benefits. Gary Hamlin, who was a Missouri physician, he decided that he would become a self-professed fool 
for the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I've lived the first 40 years of my life for personal gain. Now I want to start living for God. So he began to do something that looked rather foolish. He invested his time and his capital in founding a center for troubled teenagers. He gave his services free of charge to a clinic for battered women and children, and he decided to become more involved in mission endeavors, planning to eventually close his physician practice and go to Haiti full-time as a medical missionary. Hamlin said this. He said, materialism has lost its value. Materialism has lost its value. I would ask you and me a question this morning. Has materialism lost its value in our life? He said, before I went on my first mission trip to Haiti, I carried a lot of fears in my life. Fears of dying, fears of financial hardship. But after a while, he said, that fear began to dissipate God was weaning me away from this world's attractions. He was showing me his vision for my life. Hamlin went on and said to be a fool for Christ, for him every day. To be a fool for him made me realize how rich I would really be. I think we can say safely this morning that Gary Hamlin knows about what it means after age 40 to live life well because his purpose in life took on a much larger meaning than immediate satisfaction. He would experience both the temporal and the eternal dividends of devoting his life to glorifying Almighty God. You see, But would he have been free? Would Hamlin have been free to walk away from a medical practice, first of all, had he not generated enough assets to allow him to make that transition? Would he have been free to walk away from that practice and do the missional things that he really wanted to do in life if he were financially too in debt? that would not have allowed him to walk away from his job? Would Hamlin have been able to live life well and to do what he wanted to do, missionally speaking, had his marriage and credibility been destroyed by infidelity? Would he really been able to live life well and do the missional moments of life that he wanted to do had he lacked the ability to set the necessary short-term goals that would get him to the mission field in the next 10 years of his life? You see, young people, this morning, one of the reasons that I feel led to preach on living life well, looking at Solomon's secrets to a successful life of living life well is because I thought of you. I thought of you, and I thought of the investment, perhaps, that we could make in you in the next 10 weeks, and maybe the investment we could make in all of our lives that we could pick up something along the way, glean in Solomon's field out there of hidden treasures that we might be able, even at whatever age we are, to pick up some things that we could apply to our lives. In the next 10 Sundays, we're going to be looking at Solomon's secrets from God's Word in order to help us live life well and accomplish in life what God truly designed us to accomplish for the benefits we would reap, but more than that, for his glory, so that others could see Christ living in our lives and say, what a mighty God he serves. 
What a mighty God she serves. Last night, I was encouraged about 10.30. I received a text message. Sonia Akers texted me. She had been witnessing on her cell phone for an hour with someone she knew in Seattle. And they were trying to lead a family member to Christ. And in that course, that dialogue back and forth and text messaging, the person she was, had been praying with and praying for and to find Christ, the person said, I just need to know how to lead somebody to Jesus. And Sonia said, all of a sudden, there was the track you made for us to hand to people and to give to people and to leave with people here and there. And she said, I immediately took my cell phone and I took a picture of every page of it and texted it back to her in Seattle. She texted back and said, this is exactly what I was looking for. This was exactly what I needed. On that particular day, at that particular time, when I walked into my office some weeks back, and just out of the clear blue, the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart. And I shoved everything aside. And I sat down at my computer and tried to put that together. I say that to say this. To live life well. To bring glory to Him. Would behoove all of us to get on board with his commandments and with his statutes because it is there that we learn to live life well. Jesus said, the thief comes to kill and to steal, but I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Are you living life well this morning? Would you stand as we pray together?